Welcome to MTS. Um, as always, we thank the School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and Arts and the uh, Samuelson <laughs> Foundation. Why am I forgetting? The Sa Glesko Samuelson <laughs> Foundation. Should I do that again? Another cut? <laughs> 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 thank you, Glesko and Samuelson. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Darren Bradman today. He is uh, an assistant professor in the Annenberg School of Communications and Journalism at USC. He is, uh, I think it's fair to say, one of the foremost academic authorities on crowdsourcing. The first academic book from a major press on crowdsourcing, I think we narrowed that down. Sure. Okay. One of the first uses of crowdsourcing in a peer-reviewed journal article. Um, he's published two books on the topic, about 20 articles. Um, we're delighted to have you here today to be presenting on public sector crowdsourcing, reality, possibilities, and pitfalls. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Bradman. Hey, thanks. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's a nice campus. Um, I've enjoyed seeing the, the sense of community you have in this group, so that's really nice. Everybody gets together regularly and talks and um, has to see each other, which is always nice. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is um, crowdsourcing and, and look at kind of some different types for understanding what kinds of problems crowdsourcing can solve. Um, and then kind of look at its possibility in the public sector, broadly defined. Uh, I've always been kind of concerned with, with how can we take crowdsourcing and, and really leverage it for something bigger and better. Not to say that its business uses aren't useful, but um, a lot of the research to date has been really, uh, what I've seen is kind of focused in a lot of business and management and innovation literature, but also in the computing disciplines. Um, so I've always kind of tried to pull back a little bit, take more of a macro level look at some of the cases and some of the possibilities. Um, and it's also like a lot of fun to think about uh, what can possibly be out of these things. So um, if anything, I hope this that you come away from this thinking about how you might be able to think about your own work, leveraging the collective intelligence of crowds or the, the labor of crowds, um, and of course in ethical ways. Um, so part of this talks about ongoing work I'm doing and, and some of it talks about past work. So here we go. Um, I want to kind of give this, because I, I, it's cute to me, um, to look at kind of how fast this term has grown. Uh, the term crowdsourcing didn't exist prior to June 2006, when Jeff Howe, who's a, a, a writer at Wired Magazine, um, coined this in an article called The Rise of Crowdsourcing. Um, and right away I was hooked and, and started researching it um, and, and trying to look at its, its social good kind of applications. Um, but I always kind of periodically pull back and see how, how popular is this term. Um, for something that's a decade old, just barely, uh, we have multi-million dollar you know, defense contracts call for proposals that use the word crowdsourcing and want crowdsourcing applications. We've got the term used in SEC rulings about crowdfunding. We've got it used by presidents, right? So this has really made its way into business and government. Um, and I like to look at, at how it's rising. This is kind of a Google Trends document. Um, so it's a, it's a weird graph to plot and look at, but you'll notice that crowdfunding, which is the best I can tell, came around 19, 2008, was when it was first started. Um, we see a rise, you know, much quicker in terms of the uh, the conversation, especially on, on Google Scholar, which is by no means a perfect estimation. But there's a lot of articles that are starting to use these terms. Um, a lot of scholarly research, dedicated conferences, and what I'm actually interested in is this professionalization, right? This new layer um, that's coming about where crowdsourcing has gotten to this point of maturity, or right? it's in its adolescence or maybe early maturity, where we now have full-time consultancies and tech platforms and giants in the industry that are taking over and becoming the de facto way that you do X, Y, or Z with crowds. Um, crowds on demand that are portable, right, across different platforms. These are interesting developments that I think carry with them their own politics and their own downsides, um, but also opportunity for growth. So um, I'm, I'm a believer that I will see crowdsourcing used in business the same way that we talk about how we have Xerox as our contracted printing services, right? or we bring in an HR consultant to set up our payroll system or whatever it might be. We're gonna talk about crowdsourcing this way, I think, in, in companies and to many, um, in many ways it already is underway. Um, so I, I put that up there just to kind of show it. Here is um, my kind of definition of what crowdsourcing is. Um, I'll acknowledge that it's a bit controversial, right? As controversial as academics can get. Um, there are competing definitions for crowdsourcing. It's a dog's breakfast that everybody has thrown all sorts of concepts into. Um, some people consider this case crowdsourcing, this case not crowdsourcing, whatever it might be. I've drawn some parameters around it, um, mostly by looking at, at what these cases seem to have in common, right? what the dominant 
um, approach is to using crowds to do certain things, um, and ultimately tried to come forth with a, a typology, kind of four major approaches to using crowdsourcing that seem to be working. Um, there are plenty of other ways to, to look at typologies, taxonomies of crowds um, that are useful in their own ways, but um, for, for the purposes of this and the way that I've kind of defined it, um, I look at crowdsourcing as you know, a process where an organization issues some sort of specific challenge to a crowd, and the crowd responds, and they provide you know, solutions, they do work, um, they solve problems, they design products, um, all back to the organization, and there's a mutual benefit, right? They're motivated in different ways, um, sometimes by money, sometimes not, sometimes a mix. Um, but it's this interesting meeting in the middle, which sounds very Goldilocks, right? And I get it, it's, it's easy to critique, sounds Goldilocks, but a mix of bottom-up openness and this top-down um, hierarchical traditional form of management. Um, so if we look at this kind of you know, intersection in the middle, um, if you look at kind of traditional in-house production, right? If somebody wants to solve a problem or design a new product, they might look in-house and get their team of product designers, their team of in-house scientists, to work on the product and, and make it go forward. Um, we also see some marketing campaigns that tend to look like crowdsourcing, but I would say are kind of not. So if you remember, um, if you remember way back, I think in the early 90s, might have been the 80s, um, the M&Ms, when they came out with a new color, right, it was blue, because before that was the tan M&M, which apparently wasn't popular, I don't know. Um, they wanted to bring in a new color, and so they had this gimmicky contest where you could call in or write in on a postcard or whatever it might be, um, what you think the next color should be. Should it be pink, purple, or blue? Purple should have won, but blue won. <laughs> and purple is a better color. Per blue won, right? Um, and so they did this kind of gimmick where they wanted to get the crowd involved and get people involved in, in telling what they wanted, but they had already done the work of deciding what they were okay with, right? They already had a limited number of options, and so they were using the crowd to not really do anything intellectual, just to do a big kind of you know, survey, a big marketing research stuff. Um, and that's not particularly innovative, and I'd say that's a little too much top-down, right? Um, on the other end of it, and probably one of the most controversial arguments, I guess, that I'd make is um, when you have something that's very bottom-up, right, um, where there's not someone on a day-to-day -day basis directing the management of some sort of a process, where they're not saying um, at the company, do X and Y for us, crowd, and the crowd responds, but you have kind of a system where the crowd can play and can work among themselves to create their own norms, their own rules, and develop and build things together. Um, I would say that's kind of a bit too bottom up, right? It's not quite this middle ground. So the big controversial thing here is, is Wikipedia crowdsourcing, is open source software production crowdsourcing. Um, they have a lot of rules, they've developed a lot of their own standards for how they operate, a lot of, you know, it's really difficult to even get an article to stick on Wikipedia because of the community norms are so hard to penetrate. Um, but to me, I would argue there's not quite the magic of crowdsourcing happening there. Um, but in this middle process where an organization kind of dictates in an ongoing way, in a day-to-day -day way, in a challenge-based way, uh, we need this done and the online community provides the answers and there's this kind of meeting in the middle that makes things happen. That's where we see kind of the benefits of crowdsourcing really take off. Um, and so it's this locus of control between the two, if you want to visualize it. Um, of course we, um, well not of course, but there's a lot of reasons why crowdsourcing seems to work and there's a lot of scholars from different disciplines trying to explain what makes crowdsourcing work, right? Um, this collective intelligence idea, um, you know, that, that people work together, more heads are better than one. Um, this idea of putting people with diverse perspectives together, uh, marginality in problem solving, how people on the margins of a discipline might be able to see a problem differently with fresh eyes or different heuristics for the way they solve problems um, to come together and produce better outcomes. That explains sometimes why crowdsourcing works. Um, I'm a big believer in the internet, as a, as a major driver for why crowdsourcing is so successful today. Um, I think there was a time when the, the world had to have a certain number or certain amount of uh, internet connectivity, you know, broadband penetration and so on for this to work, um, to get a sufficient crowd, people exchanging ideas in a fast way, um, sometimes anonymity is beneficial and so on. Um, and of course they're motivated in different ways and people are looking at why do people contribute to collective efforts, right? Um, and ultimately, there's even you know, lines of thinking in, in you know, political philosophy, democratic deliberation, right, that explains why people engage in, in products or in uh, projects, why they come together, why they contribute. Um, and so I've, I've kind of seen the parallels here with the way crowdsourcing works on a t-shirt design competition site. Um, I see parallels with the way that um, 
urban planners might get together a room of, of citizens to help design a public park. And so a lot of what I've been kind of working on is trying to stitch those literatures together um, and span the boundaries and get them talking. Um, so there's a lot of kind of reasons why this work, and there are many other explanations and many other contributions that other disciplines can make. Um, crowdsourcing is, you know, it has really old roots, right? We've seen some old examples of this. Um, but I would kind of argue, again, controversially, um, there's kind of this qualitative, you know, boost that happens that's qualitatively different that happened when the internet came around um, that helped accelerate this exchange. So these are kind of the, the basis for why it works. So ultimately here's kind of the, the meaty um, first phase here, is I try to develop kind of an idea of when would you use crowdsourcing? Um, very practical, very applied. Um, why would an organization decide to crowdsource? What can they do? Um, and how would they decide which, which type to use? Because they're all very different as you'll see. Um, so if you, if you ask yourself, you know, what's your first, um, well, what do you have? Do you have an information management problem or do you have um, an ideation problem or are you creating something new? Um, if you look at an information management side, and we go down this kind of left side here, um, the next question you might ask is, do you need to locate and assemble information? Do you need to get crowds to go help you find stuff, bring stuff back together in a certain way to make a bigger collective stuff, right? Um, so if you're building collective resources, you're kind of going this first route. And I'd call that this, the knowledge discovery management approach um, to crowdsourcing. Whereas if you already had a big data set, you had information in hand, you wanted to then use the crowd to perform some sort of labor analysis to parse that data, then you end up with this other side, which is the distributed human intelligence tasking approach. Pack more words in it, it sounds more scholarly, and that's kind of what I was saying before. Um, so let's look at some knowledge discovery management examples, and a lot of these are going to be drawn from existing public sector applications already, um, or um, private companies that are doing things that the public sector is using. Um, so on the knowledge discovery and management approach, the logic here is you're trying to use an online community to expand your reach, right? to expand your, your, your ability to tap into um, or to build collective resources quicker, better um, in, in, uh, on the internet. So good examples here are the, the peer to patent project, which is a pilot project with the US Patent Office. Um, it's now been expanded to several other countries' patent offices, and it's, it's become kind of, I guess, semi-permanent in a way. Uh, the US Geological Survey's Did You Feel It? Shake Map. Ever use this? I mean, if you're new to California? <laughs> okay, there's earthquakes, and they're real. Um, and they scare me to death as a Houstonian. Um, so there's, a, there's the US Geological Survey has a shape map, right, where they have sensors that, that can detect earthquakes, but they also rely on citizen input to come tell them how severe it was, how scared they are, if they're injured, to help add to the complexity of their modeling. Um, Ushahidi and C-Click Fix, two great examples that use mapping techniques. Um, here's an example of C-Click Fix. Um, and as I go through these, I'm always curious to see who's heard of some of these cases. So C-Click Fix, hands. A half of a hand, I think, because we have half a hand. Um, C click fix, so there's two halves, that's a whole, one whole hand. Um, so C click fix is a site um, that exists, and you can go and, and look at your city. Um, in this case, you've got Raleigh, North Carolina up on the map, up on the screen. And what this is, is people can report non emergency issues in their town. So if you have a down stop sign, a pothole that's really bad, some graffiti, broken windows, that kind of stuff. You can report this to, to the, this platform, and then the city public works department subscribes to the site, so that's where they make their money as a, as a site. They subscribe to the site, and they can reply in a trouble ticket kind of way, like an IT department would, to, hey, we've acknowledged that you have a, a poor road conditions here, we're gonna go fix it. What the, the city benefits from is not only do they get better customer service, and they, they help citizens feel connected to the city, which is a huge benefit, right? Um, but they also are able to route their maintenance trucks in a more efficient way. Because normally what they'll do is they'll kind of periodically just drive the entire town and see what's up, right? which is a really bad use of, of uh, resources. So it helps them become more efficient, right? By building a collective resource, getting people to supply information in a certain format, in a certain place, they amplify their abilities right, to use their resources in better ways. Um, the Ushahidi um, map here is, is they were used in, um, I think first in Kenya, after some uh, election fraud, election um, illegal activity that happened after a pretty hotly contested political election, they mapped incidences of violence and, and intimidation at the polls. Was then rolled out in Haiti after the earthquake, or well, in many other instances between them, but in, notably in Haiti, 
to help coordinate resources and help people find each other. So even on the ground with SMS, really kind of low-tech solutions could say, I'm safe, or this road condition's really bad, or send aid here, and it helped them map out where the hotspots were that still needed to be addressed. And you can think of just many, many applications that do with mapping. Um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, so moving beyond the mapping, you know, the idea of building collective resources, again, can move beyond just making some sort of visual map of things. Um, what they did was they, they, they worked with some, some major patent holding partners, um, you know, Red Hat and so on, and they uh, siphoned off a, a small sample for a pilot project, and they posted these applications for patents online, and they said, who can come in and find evidence of prior art, right? Examples of, basically, is this a novel idea or not? Should we grant it protection under patent law? They found out that people volunteered their time, and they found instances of prior art out on the web, right? Um, so they're amplifying the abilities of a patent examiner who's short on time and resources, they amplify their abilities by providing these briefs that said, yes, there's evidence of prior art. This is not a, a new software um, design or something. Don't grant it a patent and then clog up the courts later with lawsuits. Um, so they end up making the patent office more efficient and more effective in what they did. Um, all through volunteer labor, right? People who are interested in this, um, computer scientists, law scholars. Um, and so this has now been kind of scaled up and rolled out all over the place. So again, we're, we're expanding the reach, bringing more information in. Um, to build a collective resource, which is you know, providing briefs to the government to do this better. Um, the other side of it is the distributed human intelligence tasking approach, right? So this is probably the one that might be the most familiar in the room. If you have a bunch of data that you need the crowd to do work on, um, you would then use a platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk. Heard of this? It's a popular one, I know. Okay. Especially probably in this part. Uh, Mechanical Turk, right? A pretty groundbreaking, um, groundbreaking um, site that allows people to you know, post their data and it gets broken down into small bits of work, let's say, and you can monetize it and get people to do the work for you. And you're all pretty familiar with the power of this, a lot of the shortcomings of this and so on, um, but fairly simple to use and their fees have gone up, I've heard. So careful there, it's still pretty cheap uh, way to do things. Uh, but it helps people get stuff done quicker. Of course, this is um, the interface you might all know. Uh, but way you can approach it is someone who needs their data broken down and processed by a crowd. Um, so you're someone who needs to get results from Turk workers, from Turkers. Um, or you are a Turker yourself and you want to go make some, some big money on the site by doing someone else's work. People put psychological surveys on there for their research. Um, they posted big data sets, you know, big image you know, databases and want you to go tag it. Um, all sorts of things that, that humans do a lot better than computers in terms of how quickly you can do it, whether it makes sense to write special code for you or not. You know, if I just ask you, what am I doing? You know, you could give me five keywords much quicker than it would be to write a computer code for that. Um, so it's a, it's a way to kind of do that, and, and it really makes things move a lot quicker. It's a lot cheaper, which comes with its own kind of exploitive concerns, and we can talk about the ethics later on, um, and has ultimately gotten a lot of results for people. Um, it's been used in, uh, for, for public health research in interesting ways. Uh, this is an example of you know, some scholarly research that was put out on some tests that, that where they put um, medical brochures up on uh, Mechanical Turk and asked people to translate them right, and work on the materials. So if you can imagine um, a city that might have you know, two dominant populations that each speak kind of two languages. Let's say it's English and Spanish, right? It makes sense to translate the brochure, whatever the health brochure is or the website, into English and Spanish. But what if you have kind of a small minority community that speaks a minority dialect of something, um, but it doesn't necessarily make sense or you don't have the resources to hire a translator to do that brochure, you could go on and possibly get something to translate it for a lot cheaper. And so now you've increased your, your ability to serve a community that's more diverse um, in a much more efficient, efficient way. Um, so people are starting to use distributed human intelligence tasking approach, notably Amazon Mechanical Turk, to improve this sort of thing. Um, diabetes researchers are, are having people take pictures of their eyes and post them on you know, Mechanical Turk and they're finding out that people can accurately code whether you're at risk for diabetes based on blood vessels in your eyes or something. Um, almost as good as, as going to the doctor. And so you can imagine these preventative measures that are really simple, right? If I took a picture of a mole and says, what is it, right? <laughs> and you can train some Amazon Mechanical Turkers to say it might be cancer and send them to the doctor. It's a much more efficient way to do that kind of health outreach. So there's a lot of uh, really cool applications, I think, that are really uplifting with this. 
Um, so we move to the other side, and we look at some um, some crowdsourcing, you know, the two other types. And this is kind of the ideation um, side of the house, if you will. Um, so when you need to create something new, some sort of new idea, new thing, um, the, the way you can ask this, and I think, is it empirically true? It's kind of an odd way to phrase it. Um, but are you looking for something that in the end is going to work or it's not? Right? There is, it doesn't need to be judgment or opinion on it. It either works or it doesn't. Like a scientific question, right? A chemical formula. Or are you looking for something that's more of a matter of taste or market support or public opinion? Right? Where there's no right answer to good policy or good you know, aesthetic design. Um, if you're doing the first one and you're looking for kind of scientifically um, you know, true solutions here, you could then turn to the crowd and use broadcast search. And the logic here is that by casting a wide net, you can find that solo genius out there who might see the problem differently with fresh eyes. And a lot of interesting research about sites like Innocentive, which I'll show you in a second, um, are finding that uh, a geophysicist solves a botany problem, right, better than a botanist does, right? Women perform better on this site than men, right? There's a lot of interesting um, takeaways that tend to not be seen so much in the corporate R&D space. Um, so broadcast search, you're casting the wide net, you're finding the one person who can see the challenge differently. We've got private and public applications of this. Um, gold Corp Challenge was a fun one. This is uh, now archived, but it was a Canadian gold mine that was, um, they acquired, really financially uh, troubled. They acquired a big piece of land in Ontario, and they said, we don't really, I don't know, we need to get some gold out of this thing. Um, and so they posted a prize, and they said, we'll give you a million dollars to the people who can find the next six million ounces of gold for us. And so they posted all their geophysical data about the site online, and a retired radio engineer in Australia, for instance, was one of the top prize getters. Um, who was able to help them confirm suspected deposits, which is useful in its own way, and identify new ones. And so here's a Canadian gold mining company um, who puts up a million dollars in prize money and is able to find six million ounces of gold much more efficiently than they could have done on their own. Um, or at least it confirms what their hunches were, which is also valuable, right? Before they send out, you know, you know excavators. Or however they dig for gold these days, explosives, whatever it is, right? I need to talk about a lot of things I don't know much about, like gold mining and diseases <laughs> and stuff. Um, and the President's Save Award <coughs> uh, was issued, um, started in the Obama administration, I think in the first one, um, trying to get federal employees internally, that's a lot of people in the US, to find ways and propose solutions to, and provide you know, the mathematical support in many cases for small changes that could happen in various agencies to save the government money. Right? So some of the winning ideas here were, instead of if a patient doesn't use their whole prescription at the VA, there should be some sort of system for reclaiming the unused pills or something and reworking them. You know, on the scale of the federal government and the VA system saves millions and millions and millions of dollars to taxpayers. It makes the delivery of, of uh, those services more efficient. Um, the Navy uh, has done reducing administrative distractions at the Navy, RAD, if you will. Um, and they found that their you know, Navy officers have found ways to make work safer um, for people on the job, make their work move faster, and so on. So these kind of small, small scale changes can really affect a lot. Um, but I want to look at Innocentive, and, and what's unique about Innocentive is they have a, a VP in charge of government outreach. So this is, this is definitely a company that works with the federal government in many ways, under the umbrella of a challenge.gov um, apparatus, which I've sent to you. Um, and also through the NASA Tournament Lab and a bunch of other places. Um, but they, they definitely are trying to get government agencies to post um, challenges online. Here's the way it works. And you all, if you have a scientific mind, can go make some money on the site today. And we're talking real money, right? We're talking not just a few pennies, like you might make at Amazon Mechanical Turk, um, doing kind of tedious little tasks. We're talking 10, 20, 30, $100,000 to win a solution. Now it requires, on average, about 40 hours of your time for each solution, and you usually don't win. Uh, but if you win, it's a pretty good takeaway. What happens is, um, you know, this is for, I barely know what this really is saying, enhancing bioefficacy of low water soluble active ingredient for seed treatments, of course. And what this is, is probably posted by a company like Monsanto or ConAgra or somebody who has an internal scientific R&D team, but they've determined that this problem is not worth paying their, their internal team to plot through and figure out or they can't solve it. And they've spent years already working on it and lots of money. 
So they turn to a site like Innocentive and they post up a bounty, in this case 20,000 US dollars, and they say, come up with a solution. Sometimes it's just a written solution based on prior research that you can pull out of academic articles, a theoretical solution that's just on paper. Sometimes they want you to actually test in a lab and, and report results that are replicable. But either way, um, you get paid more for the latter. If you're right, right, if this treatment works, if your chemical works, if your whatever works, um, you get the money, they get the, um, the intellectual property on the idea. You get to put it on your CV, which actually many people who win these challenges in Ascent do. They brag about it on their academic CVs. These are not, um, you know, 17-year-olds in their garage tinkering with their, you know, chemistry sets. That's a myth, right? Amateurs are a myth in a lot of crowdsourcing um, apparatuses. A lot of times they're professionals who self-select into these arrangements. These are by and large professional scientists. They have masters, PhDs, and various science disciplines um, who choose to do this work. To date, I don't think there's anyone that's actually won a challenge that didn't have a degree. Um, they aren't all science degrees, but they're usually pretty scientifically trained. Um, they work professionally as scientists. This is their side hobby, right? Um, or they're an academic and this is the way to stay sharp. Um, so you can do things like this, and of course if the company gets a breakthrough like that, they, you know, they expose themselves to some risk. If you think that's Monsanto posting that, that's they're looking for some sort of seed treatment, if you're a competitor, you can freely browse this site and kind of guess what your competitor's up to. So there's a lot of risk they take on by exposing what they're up to. Um, there's detailed you know, briefs about what they're looking for and everything. But of course, if the company can take that leap forward, it's worth it to them, right? And a lot of companies who are willing to take the risk tend to benefit. Um, here's an application for it in kind of more of a humanitarian way. Um, so a lot of agencies are starting to use Innocentive for various things. In this case, they're looking for medical waste incinerator for humanitarian emergencies, right? So can you design um, a high performance, simple, efficient, and durable incinerator that's safe to operate and affordable in low to middle income countries, right? It must be lightweight and easy to transport and assemble, build on site with accessible materials, right? And skills. So if you can come up with a design for this and you win the challenge, you win this money, in this case, $20,000, um, and the option to, or the opportunity to build, um, to improve the world, right? Um, so these are kind of the, the broadcast search is when you're looking for kind of a solution that in the end will perform the way that you needed it to according to the brief. There's a right answer, right? But what I think I'm most excited about, personally, is this is how I found and fell in love with crowdsourcing myself. Um, I was a fan of Threadless.com. Have you heard of Threadless? Sorry, I said I'd ask along the way. You've all heard of Campbell's Earth. Threadless is a t-shirt company. Um, it's changed a lot over the years. Um, it was in the original kind of article written by Jeff Howe and, and Wired that talked about what is crowdsourcing. Um, this is, I found Threadless because I was a fan, right? I, I had a lot of their shirts in college and grad school and so on. Um, and then tried to figure out, well, gosh, what is this really cool business model? It's really fascinating to me. Who else has heard of this? And then I found the article about it and thought about ways that we could take it and, and use it for the public good, um, broadly defined. So if you have a, an idea, ideation challenge, but there's no right answer, right? There's no effective threadless t-shirt, right? There's no right or wrong t-shirt. Um, there are many wrong t-shirts, but there's no necessarily right t-shirt, right? Um, you let people produce the ideas to a common area, but you also let them vet through those solutions. What you end up doing is you collapse the market research loop, right? So for somebody like Threadless, here's a site for instance, this design never got made, I don't think. But somebody downloaded, um, a, a t-shirt template with all the ink colors they have and everything to Adobe Illustrator, Adobe Photoshop, and then they designed this laser dinosaur. And they post it back to the community, and they let people on the site vote on it on a one to five scale. They can even check an I'd buy it button, which is great for Threadless because if it does win the contest after a two week cycle and it has a high rating, they'll actually print the t-shirt, they'll notify all the I'd buy it button clickers to say come get it first, and they post it on the site for general sale a day later, right? They reward the, uh, the artist with prize money, which has continued to go up because they listen to their crowd, and they know what the crowd wants. Um, and if they reprint it, they get royalties and so on. Um, but it's a genius way for Threadless to produce high quality creative designs that always sell, right? They don't ever carry a bunch of stock because they weren't sure it was gonna sell. They know exactly what people want because they've already clicked the buttons, right? So they're getting the ideas, they're getting them vetted uh, in a market research kind of way. And then they produce them on the site and they don't carry a lot of expensive overruns. 
This is arguably better than you could have if you had an in-house team of 10 designers, right, designing t-shirts. They will come up with a dud every now and then, probably often. But crowdsourcing prevents that from happening too often, right, because you have the crowd providing the ideas and vetting them. Have we seen this, this logic too with uh, the Doritos Crash the Super Bowl campaign? I think it's probably it's like its seventh year or something now. It's been around for a long time. Um, or no, it started in 2007, I think. And it's now expanded to Pepsi Max. But the Doritos brand wanted people to produce and then vote on their favorite 30 second commercials featuring their chips, right? Real high sophisticated stuff like pugs um, running after chips. I have two pugs, so I like this one. Um, but people submit these 30 second ideas. They're not amateur quality. These are all professional filmmakers, mostly. They've all been to film school. They have access to really great equipment. So these are not amateurs, right? They're really professionals trying to break it in, break into the business. They submit their, their uh, ads to the contest. People can, around the world can vote on the contest and the highest rated ones um, are finalists and the winner and usually additional ones get aired during the Super Bowl, which is great exposure for a young film student. Um, and they win now pretty substantial prize money and a trip to the Super Bowl, which they didn't originally get in the first time. Can you believe that? You win the Super Bowl contest, you don't get to go to the Super Bowl. Um, so this is an idea of crowdsourcing as well in, the, in what I call the peer-vetted creative production approach. Uh, remember, the more words, the better, right? So um, peers are vetting the ideas that are produced um, from their community. And it helps them identify the best stuff rather than having Madison Avenue ad execs guess what people want, right? And they're gonna hit a dud every time. They spend a ton of money promoting the contest itself, right? So is it, is it cheaper for Doritos to do this, to offer a million dollars in prize money and pay to promote the thing like crazy? Is that cheaper than just paying Madison Avenue? I don't know exactly what they're paying, right? Let's assume it's the same. It's still more worth it because they get more people involved and they get them active on social media voting on their ideas and there's less likelihood of them hitting a dud, right? So when I was a, a grad student, um, my PhD uh, dissertation resulted in basically threadless for the really um, sexy topic of bus stop shelters. Right? <laughs> um, went after, a, teamed up with an urban planning professor and went after a, uh, some grant funding from the Federal Trains Administration and was lucky enough to get it. So this kind of supported my PhD um, at the very end and I published a lot of stuff out of the data. Um, but the Next Stop Design Process uh, project was, was launched. Basically, it's threadless. And if you notice, there's a five-star rating system that you can vote on. You can make comments on the designs. You can upload designs with the description. And we asked people to design a bus stop shelter for an actual bus stop in Salt Lake City, Utah, which is where I was a grad student. Um, we anticipated getting people from Utah, you know, students who were attending Utah, who might be from elsewhere, because um, it was near campus, frequent bus riders, we thought we'd get napkin sketches, right, and a lot of written ideas. Um, but it's the internet, right? And so all of a sudden, the German architecture competition blog picked us up for some reason. Um, the official blog of Google SketchUp, which I think was free at the time or was their 3D rendering software that they have available, um, they posted about us to their whole like SketchUp community that produces these 3D renderings. And in three months, we got 260 designs of professional quality, all in response to a contest that promised no building, no money, right? It was just like, give us some ideas, we'll see what happens. The intention was to try to get people more involved in the traditional face-to-face -face public engagement process. Whenever they plan sort of public structures like this, they have these big workshops and town hall meetings, town hall hearings. Um, design charrettes, more intensive design workshops, and so on, to help people design and feel engaged in their city planning, right? It's part of a legal process to vet the ideas first to make it public. Um, this was to see if we could get more than just the, I think their demographics in Salt Lake City for the last, you know, dozen planning activities they had with the transit system was the average age was 63, all white, mostly women, right? Some of which didn't ride the bus at all, they just had strong opinions about where bus stops should be. Um, as you can probably imagine with not in my backyard attitudes. Um, they want to expand it. So the whole goal is just to see, can we get younger people involved? Can we get more racially, ethnic, diverse groups of people involved? We did that. We got a lot of people from around the world involved, which was not exactly what we thought we'd get, um, which raises interesting questions about crowdsourcing for democratic engagement, right? Do you want people from a city to be commenting on their city's future you know, shape? 
or do you want to open it up to everyone else? And there's competing theories on why which one is a better way to go. Um, so this was an idea where we, it was pretty successful. Um, all we did was just acknowledge the winner on the site, and that was kind of all we did. And they were really happy about it. And a lot of the people have since put this in their architecture portfolios. So people did it for a lot of reasons, interviewed them as well. Um, but they were mostly all professional designers, professional architects, that were drawn to the competition. Uh, but you can also use this process for really creative ideas uh, for, the, for the government. So um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put out a call through challenge.gov um, to, and this is off of Innocent, it's just their own website. Every year they confiscate a bunch of uh, illegal smuggled ivory, right, and own products from endangered animals. They, they confiscate those at the border and, and seize them, but then they have all this ivory and they want to make sure it's destroyed, right, so it's not usable in the market anymore although arguably makes it even more valuable in the market. There's both ways. So they wanted to crush it up and make some sort of display, I believe, at, at TSA centers or in airports, right? To just show, like, look at all the ivory we see and how horrible it is. So they held a contest to see who could come up with the best artistic use of this crushed ivory, this crushed bone, for an artistic mural, right? So they, there's creative ways you can use this to get the public involved and let people have a say over what happens. Um, and it's been used too, if you can't read that, you're not alone. Um, this is Finnish, this is from a case in Finland where they tried this with policy making. So there was an off-road vehicle policy um, that was up for renewal or needed to be rewritten. Um, you know, are people allowed to take their snowmobiles you know, wherever they want when it snows, that kind of thing. So they opened it up and they let the crowd come in and propose ideas and go back and forth on them and, and sort through them. Um, and I believe this law did pass of course, if you remember, Iceland tried to, to crowdsource their entire constitution after their economic collapse, and they almost, almost got it. Um, but it works in, in countries that have kind of small populations that are pretty, fairly homogenous in their cultural backgrounds, who have already good attitudes about democratic engagement to begin with. Um, but the idea of crowdsourcing policymaking is, is definitely you know, viable. And we've seen some cities that have tried this. Participatory budgeting is pretty popular in some cities. Um, where citizens get to vote on where they want their dollars spent. Um, so this, this idea of having, you know, there is no right solution for what the laws should be about off-road vehicles. But the crowd has a good idea of what they want, and they're the ones that ultimately have to live with the decision. And so they're really good to involve not only in coming up with ideas, but letting them sort through the ideas of their peers. So here's kind of a summary, pull back of the typology. Um, you know, the four different types of, of approaches you can use and what they're good for collective resources or data analysis problems on the data management issues or information management or the idea of, of using crowds for scientific problem solving or for design and aesthetic problems and policy problems. There are some best practices that emerge. None of these are really groundbreaking, um, if you'll notice, right? Be honest and transparent and responsive, number seven. Pretty standard if you're going to deal with an online community. Some of these, though, are not often thought about with, with people who launch um, <coughs> online communities for crowdsourcing is that it requires labor, right? To manage these crowds, to keep them motivated, to develop promotional plans with good marketing materials to get people engaged, um, knowing what their motivations are and how to motivate them, assessing the program from many angles in the end. These generate enormous amounts of data, and I can tell from you firsthand they do. Um, so analyzing it in several different ways to find out what was the right answer might be more complicated than you think. In the bus stop competition, the one that won wasn't really what I would consider the best idea but if you look at the top 20, they all have some common features that tended to appear in the top 20 that weren't in the bottom 20. So maybe if you're a trans transportation planner, you can pull back and look at what are the common things people want. Also, what were the winners? The winners two, three, four places down. Uh, what do people tend to want, tend to not want? And that can be a way to inform um, and communicate back to the citizens that you're listening to them. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and say the, the, the government, at least at the federal scale, and I think there's some interesting questions about why this is working at the federal scale and why it's working at the city scale, but we don't see a lot of state of, you know, Connecticut using this, right? But we see cities using crowdsourcing for urban design. We see federal le level using it in many different ways, right? But we don't see a lot of states, and I wonder why this, that's happening. And we can explore that if you'd like uh, at the end. Here's two examples that are, that are going on right now at the federal government that are pretty large in their scope. Um, one is challenge.gov, and I believe I circulated a, a reading about this, good case study on this. It's kind of a nice portal for several challenges, several thousand challenges from, from government agencies 
to try to get um, the crowd involved in improving um, the function of government, the business of government, making it more inclusive and um, scientific breakthroughs and more efficient. We also have the NASA Tournament Lab um, here on the left, which is involved in a bunch of stuff. We're partnering with sites like Kaggle and Innocentive um, to you know, improve. NASA at work is, for instance, kind of like the Federal SAVE Award, is to see how you can improve efficiency at, at NASA, so all NASA employees can contribute to this and be acknowledged in the competition format. So there's a lot of ways that they're using this, just at NASA. NASA is probably one of the more cutting edge federal agencies, as you may or may not have guessed. They're resource wary, I guess. <laughs> they're always, there's always a threat of them losing their funding with every new Congress. Um, so they, they definitely are pushed to think more outside the box, and they're doing moonshot type stuff, right? So they're, they're already kind of primed to think um, bigger. Um, and they have a really great community they've already built. Other agencies are a little less open. The EPA, for instance, not so down with crowdsourcing. Um, and there might be some historical reasons or personalities involved, maybe, why that is. Um, but I want to kind of look at some more, some more interesting. How can we use crowdsourcing beyond what's already being done for the public? Um, and, I, and some of these are, are pie in the sky, but I think this is kind of where it gets really interesting, is to start to think about, okay, so what now? Right? How can we solve various problems? Um, do you remember when the uh, Malaysian Air Flight, um, Malaysian Air Flight something, 330 or whatever, went down in the Indian Ocean? And they, they kind of were just now starting to find pieces of it to confirm it went down. Um, but it was gone for a long time, right? And nobody knew what happened to it. So they sprung um, Tomnot into action, right? Where you could go on to you know, walk through and get the public to tag various bits of satellite imagery with what they thought was an oil slick or a piece of aircraft wing or something. And that helped improve, you know, and they used it in the algorithms and so on to improve their search. It wasn't ultimately very helpful, but it was a way to get the, the, the public involved. And what was actually really helpful was they, they eliminated a lot of terrain. Right, they removed it from the search, which helped them focus on other areas. Similar occurrence, similar in some ways, right? The Boston Marathon bombing, right? When this, one, when this happened. Um, 4chan, lovely place, and Reddit, right? <laughs> Two different communities, um, some overlapping, went right to work trying to figure out who these guys were, right? What happened, who were the bombers, where were they? Um, they found people carrying backpacks, right? And various photos that were shot and posted on like the Fox News station, they got a hold of footage, anything that was on the news that was public, they grabbed, and they started sorting through it in their own communities to figure out who did it. Of course, this led to bad things, right? They pointed to anyone that was, had brown skin, anyone carrying a big backpack. They ruined lives, right? This was, this was a bad thing, because the crowd was sent running amok to try to figure out who they thought terrorists were based on their limited knowledge of what they thought bombs were and how you would carry those, based on limited footage, right? Ultimately, it was Lord & Taylor department store cameras that actually caught some of the best images of the bombers. And that was fed directly to the FBI, and the FBI was able to vet that and figure it out and find the guys uh, by shutting down the city of, of Boston, as you might remember, which is pretty unprecedented. What if we could use this logic, right? And I think what was really phenomenal about this case, it got a lot of bad press because look at Reddit and 4chan going nuts, you know, pointing at all these people and calling them terrorists and ruining their lives in a really reckless way. Um, and it was reckless, right? And I don't think we should really encourage this. And so I guess I raised the question of what if we could take this and build some sort of website that always was ready to spring into action, right? What if it was an FBI website or Department of Justice website that existed that was ready to spring to action right away? Let's say there's a Boston Marathon bombing. You go to helpoutthefbi.gov or whatever slash Boston, right? And all the news agencies are told to cover this and everybody goes there. And so instead of having people going to Reddit and having their own kind of you know, disgusting banter about race and terrorists and so on, we had an official government clearinghouse where certain leads could be presented and vetted and dismissed. Things could be opened and closed publicly on the site. But what I think is really great is that the Boston Marathon bombing showed that citizens cared, right? And people were really willing to donate their energy and donate their headspace to sorting through, to get a terrorist, right? To figure out, you know, get some justice. What if we had a way to funnel that interaction through more official means um, to help citizens really feel like they're part of it and help them, you know, potentially be rewarded and acknowledged for that work? Um, people are remarkably altruistic, especially in moments of crisis. And so there's a way to kind of funnel that energy. And to this date, I wonder why the government hasn't done this, right? These things unfortunately happen all the time. Um, we have bombs, we have shooters. It would be great if 
the news came on and said, of course, if you have tips, go to fbi.gov slash San Bernardino, or whatever it might be. People could go in and look up that um, information. So we could use it for you know, homeland security issues, for policing, of course, many downsides to that as well, ethical problems. Here's another instance, and this is actually um, going on by a team of researchers at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, at least in the state of North Carolina, there are pretty strict laws about um, advertising cigarette products, tobacco products, you know, in a state known for tobacco, by the way, historically, so this is touchy. Advertising tobacco products alongside stuff aimed at kids, right? So for instance, you know, you can't have slushy in the middle of cigarette ads, um, or you can't have a ride along, you know, pony right in front of a cigarette ad, right? There's, there's rules on this in North Carolina. Um, what they were finding is that there were like two officers for the entire state that were in charge of going around on a circuit to visit various 7-Elevens to write tickets and citations, right? Two officers for all these gas stations. Um, so of course, it would take, you know, sometimes four, five, six, seven years before your policeman would be back to write you a ticket. Of course, who cares, right? It's just a $100 ticket, whatever. But it's still harmful, right, to see these things advertised to kids. So what this, what this team has done, this group's called CounterTobacco.org, I'll work with them briefly. Um, what they're doing is they're having people, mostly uh, anti-smoking youth groups, are getting involved, going around and taking photos and plotting on a map where these violations are occurring. And then the regulators of the state can see these maps and go around and issue tickets in a more efficient way and stay on top of it. Is this pretty big brother? Sure, right? <laughs> But Big Brother for good. So there's there's kind of pros and cons to this sort of thing. Um, but you know, what if we could take citizens and help them report all sorts of health issues, help report the conditions of walking trails in public parks, right? Um, so that they could be fixed and made more safe in a more regular way. Ways to, to regulate various things, safety at gas pumps, you know, whatever, right? Things that are not necessarily checked on a daily basis. Um, citizens can be involved in, in tapping into that and, and help take charge of the neighborhood again. And there's actually good research that people will do this if they're given an opportunity to do it. Um, here's another what if, right? So NASA, um, they have this Soil Moisture Active Passive Satellite. You've all heard of this? Yeah. Um, I love these guys. Um, and the Coco Raza Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network. Um, they're basically concerned with soil moisture and precipitation, pretty major things um, for, the, for the Earth's health, right? And global warming and so on. They have a satellite up there that follows around and takes pictures and, and assesses estimates of soil moisture, right, which is a major, major thing um, with climate change. And it goes around, right? This satellite's already past due and could go dark any moment. And given the funding, <laughs> might not be able to be replaced for many, many years. This model that they get from these satellite images is pretty good at predicting the accuracy of the soil moisture and tracking what's happening. Um, but of course, you can go in your backyard and scoop up soil and it's even more accurate. So what they're, they're, they're thinking about doing is getting people mobilized to go out, get cheap little sensors for their iPhones that can measure soil moisture, and any time a, a satellite goes overhead, it dings them and says, hey, in the next few minutes, while the satellite is getting your actual reading, can you go out and scoop moisture and report it back? And people are actually kind of willing to do this. It's something you might roll out soon. And what would happen then is that they can provide this missing piece to this complex model. If the satellite went dark, they could rely on citizens to provide a pretty accurate estimation until they could get a satellite going. So there's ways to kind of you know, bring citizens into developing these pretty complex um, you know, predictive solutions. So if you can get citizens on the ground to collect soil moisture or whatever, it's a great way to provide a backup for if these satellites go down, if these other systems that exist. Um, it, going back to, to Homeland Security concerns, there's um, the BioWatch program, for instance, is, is rolled out by DHS. Um, these are like refrigerator-sized um, metal boxes that exist in strategic points of interest. And they always make a big point, big deal about this at the Super Bowl. They'll roll it out, and it's, you know, the reporters stand in front of them and go, what is this Department of Homeland Security box? And what it is, it's just a sniffer that looks for biological agents that have been released in the air. Um, so they can kind of act quickly and prevent and, and get people to doctors. Um, so if you can get citizens involved in, you know, installing sensors on their homes or something when they become more automated, uh, there's a lot of ways to imagine what can be once the technology catches up, or even in certain ways now, in getting people to act um, to help in these situations. Um, and another what if here, what if we could use um, sites like SciStarter? Have you heard of SciStarter? 
a CI, yeah. Gosh, I just you know, gave me all sorts of sites today, so great. Um, SciStarter.org, this is a, um, a website uh, where they host all sorts of citizen science projects. And you're all fairly familiar with, with citizen science activities, using citizens to provide data collection analysis in ways they can manage for various agencies. What SciStarter tries to do is provide a one-stop shop for museums, independent researchers, researchers at universities, and some federal or, or small, small agencies can post their projects and say, we would like you to go out and count butterflies today. And it's aimed at fifth graders, right, or whatever. And they go out and they, kids can get involved in counting butterflies, or more sophisticated. You know, let's tag some stars um, from images we've captured. What if we took a site like this, right, and added more oomph to it, right? What if we had something like a US Citizen Science Corps, right, which is an idea I've kind of been batting around. Um, what if you gamified it? Right? You incentivized this. You brought K through 12 kids in part of STEM education programs and got them involved in counting butterflies, which might not even be accurate, but let's say they're doing it. They get involved. They can earn points and badges and so on. And this has become a lifelong um, commitment right, to serving your community, serving your government. Um, and what if we frame this, you know, this is what we consider to service to country, right? which is kind of a provocative thought. When we say, I served my country, we almost always mean military service which isn't a bad thing, but could we enlarge that, right? So the people who want to serve their country by helping the Smithsonian catalog bugs, right? <laughs> or whatever it is, um, or helping scoop soil for NASA and build up points. So eventually they get you know, a behind the scenes tour at the Smithsonian once they've reached a certain level. It'd be interesting to think about a lifelong engagement with science, a lifelong engagement with your sense of pride in your community, your sense of national identity perhaps, all wrapped up in some sort of a neat platform. Um, to say I'm part of this U.S. Citizen Science Corps for 30 years now, and I'm a captain in the Corps or whatever, right? I've got 40,000 points, whatever it might be. Um, so studying what will be the incentive mechanism for that is kind of a, an interesting future engagement, I think. So finally turn to um, some lingering issues. So these are not all, it's not all rosy. Um, as you can probably imagine, there's some, some errors, some problems that come along with crowdsourcing. Um, it's not a neat, clean process by any means, and there's a lot of fallout. Um, there's a lot of issues that come along with crowdsourcing. Number one, you've got kind of digital divide issues, issues of access. Not everybody's on the internet, and not everybody will be on the internet, right? There are plenty of um, socioeconomic reasons, geographic reasons why not everyone will be on the internet. And so if you take something like citizen engagement in transportation planning, and you make it online only, through a crowdsource mechanism or citizen engagement space, you eliminate people who choose not to or cannot afford to be on the internet. Right, or not able to be on the internet physically. Um, so I've always kind of thought that crowdsourcing for the public sector needs to be a complementary rather than supplement, um, supplemental process, right? Or supplanting, sorry, it needs to complement rather than supplant face-to-face um, -face mechanisms. So traditional public engagement will still always be there, I think, it should be. We can't all be expected to be digital overnight. Um, lots of legal issues <coughs> with intellectual property and copyright. Uh, there's already interesting kind of rules about this, that in incentive if you submit someone's idea and somebody takes it and so on, you can sue, and there's, there's complex arrangements. But as we imagine kind of moving forward, um, we have intellectual property, we also have free speech issues, right? If I'm hosting an online public engagement space um, to discuss the new skate park that's going in downtown, and I get people who come in and they curse and their ideas, you know, are one way or another, it becomes interesting to see what their public forum rules are for how you censor or downvote or hide these people's ideas. Because if they could say it in a face-to-face -face meeting, they should be able to say it online. But we know from, from bubbles of thought that people can kind of you know, circle down the drain with each other and, and it becomes the comment section on YouTube and it's a bad thing. Um, so there's some interesting kind of design decisions that need to go into this that need to follow um, law and free speech norms. Labor issues and exploitation, this is kind of running um, through, there's, there's a sort of loosely organized group called No Spec, which pushes against the um, speculative labor thing that comes with crowdsourcing. Um, lots of contests, you know, come win our design contest by submitting your design and then you read the fine print that says, we own all your ideas, whether you win or lose. <laughs> it's not so good if you're a struggling designer um, or a successful designer. Um, so a lot of, it's really important to, to design apparatus that, that rewards people only when they've won something, right? Only when they've actually made it, and not to take their ideas. Because we're starting to see some organized efforts now from NoSpec, 
there's mostly industrial designers and graphic designers pushing back on exploitive contests. Um, there are now, there's been a lawsuit that was resolved um, privately. We, it was, I don't know the amount, but it was um, Ote v. Crowdflower, I think. It was about uh, minimum wage laws with Mechanical Turk. So people are starting to push back and say, if I work full time at Mechanical Turk and I can't make a minimum wage, right, what does that say? And it's an international space too, so it's even complex what a, what a living wage really means. Um, and we see some, some really great researchers like Lily Arani at UCSD, who's doing work on, on uh, labor issues and kind of union bill of rights idea um, with Turkers. Um, it's interesting to see how professions are changing. Some of them are being destroyed entirely almost, um, like stock photography is kind of eradicated now because of iStock Photo. Um, but a lot of industries are changing. And so the idea of, um, first of all, being an online community manager is a new profession that really didn't exist 10 years ago. And now they hire like gangbusters, right? They hire a lot of my PR students who come out. Um, but managing these online communities for productive crowdsourcing engagements is gonna be a new skill that's gonna have to be taught somewhere, right? Um, and also, new professions are just going to have to live with the idea of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. It's a normal thing. And so if you're a, uh, an industrial designer and you design, design you know, spatulas or something for your kitchen line, you're going to have to get used to the idea that your company might be crowdsourcing designs and spatulas from here on. And they still value your idea and your, your, your perspective as a professional designer, but now you have to know how to manage these projects with crowds, how to give credit. To award contests. It's going to be a whole new skill set that's emerging. Is how to deal with these, you know, when to know to reach out for intellect and bring it back in. Um, what I think is most intriguing for the government sector, for the public sector here, is this idea of uh, what I call the consultative layer. And this is kind of research that's unfolding with a um, PhD student of mine, Kristen Guth, uh, at USC. And we're looking at um, this idea, this professionalized space, right? I talk about how crowdsourcing is becoming very professionalized. Um, what's going to happen now when these tech companies take over and they have these pretty hardwired political perspectives or design decisions that went into the platform initially that are still there, right? These affordances of the platforms, the politics of the platforms, how are they going to shape future interactions between cities and, and citizens? Um, and so, you know, you've got this kind of, these tech vendors and their platforms, these consultants, are kind of this layer between citizen and government and what comes with it. Two examples from some interviews we've been doing with, with the founders and CTOs of some of these, these firms that are now you know, mature and robust, that are starting to acquire their competitors, right? So we're seeing an emerging dominant couple of firms that are about to take over, including a dominant one that just went belly up suddenly, <laughs> um, overnight, which is interesting. Um, what's gonna happen with them? So here's an example. You know, what, looking at the, the ideals, the normative ideals of deliberative democracy, right? Um, there's ideas of accountability and all these sorts of things. Um, this tension between should someone from the city be the one that has the authority to comment on the design of the future city? It's an interesting question. Or, following open innovation research, we want to open it up and get great ideas from everywhere. These things are at odds, right? Um, and here's illustrated with two different founders who don't know each other. Um, there's a, there's a woman at, at PlaySpeed, Colleen Hardwick, who um, their whole company exists to provide this, you know, 10 different layers of, we will make sure that this person is only from, you know, Vancouver for the Vancouver bike path discussion. Um, and they believe that people will become more influential the more authenticated they are. So they have a whole business plan is to make sure that if you do an online engagement, they're from Vancouver. Meanwhile, you have somebody like Nick Bowden at MindMixer, right? Who says, we authenticate you're real, but we don't really verify your identity or location. Who cares where you come from? If you were in Kansas City and you did a bike path, right, we want your expertise in Nashville, right? Which is an interesting perspective, and they're both kind of right, right? So these, this is a tension that's, that's baked into the design decisions of a tech platform. And so when a city is choosing a vendor, they usually choose them based on price and kind of their past clients. They don't think too much about some of these levels perhaps. And unfortunately, as something like MindMixer starts to eat competition and starts to take over, they become the dominant paradigm, the dominant way of thinking and governing people's actions and interactions with the government. Um, and I think these are pretty important questions that need to be asked. Um, here's another example, too, that, that talks about kind of, you know, one particular political perspective on, um, on urban development, right? This is very anti-big box, anti-strip center, um, which, of course, there are people who are for this type of development, right? 
Um, planning and design for a better world is kind of part of their mission, but we don't want Home Depot and Cheesecake Factory. We all know that's not good for anybody, right? So we're not gonna do it, right? So they actually won't take clients that wanna build that sort of thing. So we have another tech company here. Um, this is the Sasaki uh, Crowd Gauge tool um, that says we just, this is not who we are. And so if you're gonna contract with a site like this to do your citizen engagement activity, to design your, your urban space, they are gonna push their own vision of what they think walkable new urbanism is, right? Which is full of its own kind of pros and cons. Um, so these are some of the things that are starting to emerge that I think are important for the consultative layer. Um, I think I'll end it there. We can talk about crowdfunding too, which is kind of a separate but interesting topic too, but um, I think that's kind of enough to get maybe the discussion going. <laughs> Thanks.